welcome to Learn to Live Stress-Free. This is Christine Wright with Dr. Robert Wright, Jr., your go-to wellness coaches of www.stressfreenow.info. Our featured guest today is Lisa I. Perez, speaking on communication concepts. Lisa I. Perez, Senior Professional in Human Resources, is the president of Human Resources Consulting Company, HBL Resources Incorporated, which specializes in improving business performance through employee engagement. Lisa brings over 23 years of HR experience and serves as a trusted advisor and consultant to small and large organizations, including Virgin Hotels, Mikasuki Resort and Gaming, and Goldman Properties, to name a few. Lisa is a member of the Society for Human Resources Management, where she has earned her Senior Professional in Human Resources Certification. She volunteers for the Miramar Pembroke Pines Regional Chamber of Commerce as the chairperson of the Ambassadors Committee and volunteers for the Broward County Kids and the Power of Work program. She is a certified bridge builder trainer who facilitates generational diversity in the workplace and is also a DISC certified human behavior specialist. Lisa speaks on a variety of topics and has conducted sessions in 2014 for the HR Florida State Conference Society for Diversity Leadership Retreat, HR Association of Palm Beach County, HR Association of Broward County, and the Miramar Pembroke Pines Regional Chamber of Commerce. Originally from Brooklyn, New York, she's a wife, mother, grandmother, and a craft geek. (laughs) Lisa, welcome craft geek audience. Uh, We're glad to have Lisa with us here today. Thank you so much, Christine. It really is a pleasure to be here. I want to say hello to your audience, your listeners, and, of course, Dr. Bob as well. Yes, Lisa, welcome. Thank you. And, uh, Lisa, please tell us about yourself and what led you to the work that you are currently doing. Absolutely. Well, uh, having been in HR, particularly in hospitality, over 23 years, I launched HBL Resources originally in 99 and then kind of relaunched, stepped away for a while and relaunched about three and a half years ago. I'm very passionate about employee management development and improving communications in any way possible, which is why I am so passionate about the generational diversity as well as the DISC model of human behavior and this as well communication concept. Excellent. Thank you. Now, uh, Lisa, can you outline and define the five major concepts of the communication process? Absolutely. You know, I'm so encouraged before I do that to be able to have this conversation today. As you may have heard back in 2011 and 2012, Towers Watson did a change in communication study report, and it showed that of the companies that have highly effective communication practices, 1.7 1.7 times as much more likely to outperform their peers, or as, you know, they are they are 1.7 times more likely to outperform their peers when they have highly effective communication processes. And there are five major components of that communication process. The first, there's the sending of the message, right? We form the idea. We evaluate what's the purpose of the idea. We translate that idea into words in most cases, and then transport those words to communicate the idea. Second is receiving, right? Recognizing the words, hearing the message, the total understanding of the words that they convey, and sometimes even recreating the words with the idea conveyed by the sender happens in that receiving process. Third, there's interpretation, and that depends a lot on the attitude of the receiver, their beliefs, of the receiver regarding what that message is. Obviously, there's a lot more conversation and interpretation that I think we'll have time to get to. And then fourth is feedback, the response to that sender's message, explaining to the sender how the message was heard, interpreted, perceived, right? We know about that, right? We always say, well, you, what I think I heard you say is, and all of those questioning techniques to make sure we're clearly understanding. That's in the feedback process. And then finally, the results, that final goal of the communication process brought about only after a clearly defined understanding of the message has been achieved. Let me offer an example, if I may. Let's say I tell Christine, please close the door. The message is sent. Christine hears the request. The message is received. 
Now, there are two doors in the room. So Christine asks, which door do you want me to close, right? That's all in the interpretation. And so I answer, the door on the left. That's part of feedback. Christine closes the door on the left, providing the results that were expected. But you can imagine how a receiver of a message might close the wrong door due to unclear communication or a breakdown in one of those processes or the interpretation and their perception that one door might have been left further open than another, right? So that's kind of an example of that full process. Excellent. Thank you, Lisa. You know, I like that example. It's very clear and very simple. It strikes me, though, with this model makes a lot of sense, but most people don't think of their communication in terms of these five components. Mm -hmm. And when you're listing them and explaining that, feedback helps Mm -hmm. in terms of wanting to get the result. Um, Of these five components, where is communication? I mean, I can actually see communication breaking down in any parts of any of these five parts, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but where is communication most likely to break down and why? And you're absolutely right, Christine. Communication breakdowns can occur in each of the areas of the process, but it does most often occur in the interpretation stage because interpretation and also feedback, they really go hand in hand, and that can be due to several factors. Cultural differences in interpretation is very important to note. Generational differences as well. Hearing the same message but understanding it in completely different ways. Obviously, we can't you know, deny intense emotions and defensiveness on the part of one or both of those participants in the communication process. That could certainly be where breakdowns occur. Absence of sensitivity, lack of concentration, distractions, and one of my very favorites, preoccupation. You know, in this world that we live in, we are constantly multitasking, and it truly is counterproductive to the ability to effectively interpret a message. Um, That is a critical piece that I'm always really, listening is a whole other topic as well, but uh, preoccupation and multitasking can certainly provide those distractions. And then, of course, we have to think about speech impediments as well, strong accents, maybe slurring of words, speaking too softly, you know, all of those things can definitely create some breakdowns in the communication process. It's important to note as well that the sender is likely to be the most knowledgeable about whether a miscommunication or breakdown might have occurred in that process, and they know what the expected result is in their intended message, so their role as the message sender is to take steps to correct any misinterpretation, any communication breakdown, determine which of the barriers is hindering the process, realize at what point did the breakdown occur, and then take steps to correct or neutralize those barriers. I'd love to give you a personal example. Uh, My husband and I enjoy reading time together, and we often do so at 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, just before winding down. And I said, hey, we haven't read in a while. Why haven't we been doing this? And he says, well, you're coming to bed too late. Well, I could do one of two things. We could start the snowball rolling. That would only go down negative consequences. Or I could double back and say, well, what do you mean by late? Define late, right? And so when he's talking 10 o'clock and I'm thinking 9 o'clock, there you see that communication could have easily broken down without the message sender, in that situation me, kind of doubling back to make sure we're on the same page. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. (laughs) As you give that example, Lisa, and and something that you um, mentioned about preoccupation in the communication that there's an emotional, um, to me, an emotional component of this, Mm -hmm. which I'm not sure where this feeds through, that when something is said, depending on how you're receiving it, you have an emotional response, which may or may not be warranted in how that message was sent. Absolutely. The the other thing that you mentioned in terms of the the preoccupation, Mm -hmm. you know, we're either... I'm listening to you, and you're absolutely engaging, and I'm listening to you, but let's say I'm bored. Mm -hmm. Then my mind drifts. I'm preoccupied. What did she say? What am I supposed to answer? Absolutely. And that snowball effect that you talk about with your husband, I think many couples, there are probably couples out here listening in the audience, something is said, and, okay, you just raise that red flag for me. Okay, here we go. 
That's right, absolutely. And that, I think, feeds into you know some of my other work that you mentioned earlier in the DISC model of human behavior. A person's attitude is going to be critical, and by attitude I mean their behavior style, their personality style. Th- those filters can create a positive or negative effect on the receiver, depending on where that is. And, you know, those are some of the barriers as well. And we can go into certainly the value systems and attitude being part of that in terms of a communication breakdown. Because once we understand a person's behavior style and uh, personality style, we can filter our message appropriately for their listening ears, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. One of the things that Uh, one of my coaches says is that we have more problems over the same word Mm -hmm. because the same word may have different meanings to different people. Depending on what the history of that word is in their life, you're bringing certain connotations to a word that, you know, let's say dinner time, one family always ate around the table, but, Mm -hmm. you know, your spouse's family ate in front of the television. That's right. Mm -hmm. So it brings up a whole different set of feelings and responses. Absolutely. And, you know, I think we see that often in this day and age with blended families and things of that nature and, and these not just cultural but regional dynamics. We could do things differently in Florida than we do in New York. Even something as subtle as location, you know, geography plays a big part in perception and receiving that message, how we receive that message. So you're absolutely right, especially from a cultural perspective. One word can mean two different things in one Hispanic community versus another. (laughs) Very true. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lisa. Great, Lisa. I've been listening. I just want to ask you this question. From your view, based on your experience, what are some of the most common barriers that can cause the communication process to break down? You know, a person's attitude, we talked about that, their personality, their behavior style definitely can create a barrier because you're not speaking my language, so to speak, right? In addition, we each have our own set of beliefs and most importantly, our value systems. And we've seen a lot of work on value systems. Well, in some of our communication and team building workshops, we tell a story. It's called the island story, and it involves five characters shipwrecked on two separate deserted islands. We provide some storyline and ask the participants at the end of the story, rank these characters. Who's the best person? Who's the worst person? And obviously it's a communication workshop, so it's given limited storyline information. And it's interesting to see the issues that get raised due to our value systems and how we perceive these characters in the story, and then what changes as a result of maybe that additional communication of information that maybe nobody thought to ask about. And so we have a lot of fun and learn to listen to one another's perspectives and understand their value systems. And by value systems, we're talking about that theoretical value system, right? We want to discover the truth. We desire knowledge. Those are the type of individuals who really want an opportunity to learn. You know, they might be the ones who subscribe to National Geographic and Newsweek and that kind of thing. And then we have the economic value system, right? That monetary reward or what is useful in my life. They have typically excellent financial um, acumen, they are intelligent, well-investigated purchases, you know, all of those kinds of things. And then we have the aesthetic value. The aesthetic speaks to the desire for beauty and emotion and, and form and harmony. And it's so funny because these same values feed into that model of human behavior that we enjoy talking about so much, Dr. Bob. And then, of course, you've got social, right? That love of people. If people is... Uh, my value system, that's the most important, then I desire communication, I desire relationship. And then political, right, that sense of power and authority and enjoying challenges and competition and things of that nature. All of these value systems really play a part. And then, of course, you've got the religious, that need for unity and camaraderie surrounding those religious beliefs that we that we hold sacred, right? And so when we have disconnects in these areas, these value systems, these value types, we can really create some major challenges and conflict that these barriers are coming from. Great, Lisa. Uh, I love your explanation. I just wanted to ask you this. Uh, there's a humorous TV commercial which explores gender differences. I want you to just briefly address that. In the TV commercial, the first 
set, uh, they show a group of women, I, I believe it's seven or eight women, sitting around and watching the TV, and they come to the point where the bowl with the chip and the dip is empty. <laughs> and so they said, oh, we need more dip. Uh, and then half of the women get up and they go in the kitchen to get the dip. Mm. Uh, so I think five of the eight <laughs> get right. up to go get the chips and the dip. And right. then they switch to a scene, and there's a, a group of, you know, eight men in the room watching the <laughs> football game. I don't know if it's the Super Bowl or not. And then they said, you know, um, uh, we're out of dip. And they said, yeah, you know, Alex, it's your turn. <laughs> and then he, then 15 minutes later, Alex is still sitting there. Right. And so that difference of, you know, in the commercial at least, they yeah. show that the women – uh, were in um, in a different place. So can you, right. can you just speak to that type of gender thing? I know it's um, a sore point for some people, but there are some real differences, I believe. Oh, no, for sure, for sure. And, and you know, I tend to, uh, that is funny, I'd love to see that commercial. I can just get a visual of it. Um, and I think that that speaks to not only the gender differences, but where the individual's values are. Women are social creatures, you know, much more so, I think, than men. And I think most people would tend to agree with that without so much trepidation. And so because of that love of people, you know, you've got all these eight women getting up or five, however many, a lot more than the man who, yeah, our social isn't so much that. Maybe ours is a, a more need for power. And I'm going to tell you to go get it as opposed to offer to do so myself because the relationship isn't that important. It's being in charge. And so I think that that's a really great example as well of, of those value differences that do have a gener- uh, I'm sorry, a, um, a gender bend on them. Okay, great, Lisa. I love that explanation. Let, let me just jump quickly to this issue of listening, you, which you mentioned earlier. Can you talk uh, briefly about the importance of listening in the communication process? And then also what I was thinking about is that when you were mentioning impediments, to understanding, I think many people also have hearing uh, impediments that sometimes they're aware of. Some people are wearing hearing aids, and other people may have hearing loss and may not be aware of. For example, they spent their youth going to heavy metal and rock concerts, standing next to the speaker, and now they're a little bit older and they're not hearing as well And when someone's speaking to them. Absolutely, which which all feeds into listening. I mean, I, I don't think it was mentioned earlier. I left it out, but uh, I also studied sign language for quite some time. It's my goal to be certified as an interpreter one day. And so that definitely adds a whole nother dynamic, right? How do we go about listening? And I think, you know, most of the studies are out there. They share how communication is affected by the words that we use, the tone in our voice, and our body language. And of those three, you know, when people are asked in several of my workshops, well, what do you think is the most important? Several will go to words or tone, not realizing that body language speaks far greater in those situations. I can hear what you're going to tell me before you open your mouth just by the way you're frowning or your hands are crossed or all of that. And all of that has to do with the communication process. So we have to remember that those three things are in there. And then, of course, as listening, we have to remember the importance, and it has its own three components as well. It, we obviously need the attention, right? We talked about the multitasking earlier, how you position yourself for the interaction to listen is very important. Ensuring that you're aware of that individual's verbal and nonverbal signals, and you can't know those nonverbals unless you're paying close attention to what they're saying and how they're saying it. You know, you've got to make sure that you're maintaining eye contact and that you're giving your undivided attention to the message sender. And it's something that we all could do a lot better, especially in the digital world that we live in. And then you've got reception, right? When you're required to listen, clear your agenda, you know, put all of the things on hold, really position yourself. And, you know, I I had an administrative assistant who on Monday mornings, first thing she wanted to do was talk about her weekend. And I'm the kind of personality I'd much rather get down to business, but I know that the social aspect is so important for her, and I want to feed into that as well. And so I would totally move away from my computer, move my keyboard, and face her screen squarely so that she knew I was ready to listen and and to receive the messages that she wanted to share. And this enables you to clearly and consistently think about what's being said when you do give that undivided attention and when you have the opportunity to give your own responses, 
you really have a better understanding of the clear message that's very important. And then, of course, you've got perception and listening, right? Ensure that everybody, all the parties participating in this interaction or conversation are perceiving the same message. You've heard it said before, you know, ten people could hear the same message and all walk away with a different understanding, right? Don't get caught in the assumption trap. You know, ask questions to ensure clarity that perception is important. As I go back to my um, example earlier, okay, honey, what do you mean as late? Define late. And that's where our miscommunication was, how we're defining late, not anywhere else. So listening is critical, and I think that we as a culture have to start getting back to the um, effective listening. That's great. I love what you said there, Lisa. To quote you, you said, don't get caught in the assumption trap. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to mention briefly two things. One, you mentioned eye contact, which from a cultural standpoint, in American culture, direct eye contact has a certain presumption. However, that Mm -hmm. same behavior in other cultures would be considered inappropriate and or aggressive. Correct. And so part of the thing is that as we interact with people from other cultures, we may not we, we have to be careful not to assume, like, for example, if a That's person's correct. not giving us direct eye contact, mm-hmm. it doesn't have the same meaning. Right. I remember many years ago I knew uh, a gentleman from Africa, and I said mm-hmm. to him one day, I said, oh, what are you angry about? And so he was startled mm-hmm. because he said to me, he, says, he said, I'm not angry. So the look that he had on his face in American culture meant that he would be frowning. But right. in his culture, that was a different look. Right. And so that was my, that was my first introduction. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, cross-cultural, uh, as you're saying, uh, that's very good that you say an assumption trap not to mm-hmm. fall into. And then the other thing is that at least the research that I had seen a while back about what percentage is nonverbal versus the words, I remember being startled seeing some statistic which said that only 7% of an in-person communication, mm-hmm. the communication uh, is the actual words. Mm-hmm. And so... I think while body language is important, I think the um, when you were talking about tone and the mm-hmm. pace, and then, of course, we have to remember when a person sighs the or time. rolls their eyes, it yeah. doesn't matter what words are being said, <laughs> that it has a different meaning. That's so, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that example as well with the sighing. You know, and you're right. I think we're talking about the exact same um, survey where 7% is words. I think 55% was, you know, the body language, and then the rest is, is the tone, you know. And I'm a, I'm a sire. I sigh just to release the stress. I, I think I, I love what you guys are doing with Stress Free Now. And I just relieve the stress that way. Yet anybody sitting around me would go, what's wrong? On the contrary, everything is right. I'm feeling good right now. <laughs> Great. So, Lisa, can you give our audience some advice based on your experience for One, asking the right question when you're engaged with someone in a communication, and then, two, asking how to ask the question or how they might go about asking the question in the right way. Because, again, as you're saying, that syntax matters, tone matters, um, man bites dog versus uh, dog bites man, you know, those are the same words, have totally opposite meaning and implications. You know, with asking questions, how we say what we say is what we're what we're talking about, right? Typically, an open, positive attitude is going to be important. And I think it's important because some people don't like to be questioned. Depending on their behavior style and their, their personality, they don't like questions. So doing so delicately and informing the message sender why we are asking the questions for our own clarification, you know, we always hear about the I statement. I understand... Um, rather, you know, I, I think what I'm hearing you say is so that we really understand what's, uh, what the sender's message is. I think communicating is, the entire message back to the receiver is important as well so that there's no misinterpretation in word meaning because, like you said before, that could be, you know, of a, a barrier as well. Semantics, word choice, right, all of those kinds of things. And then, of course, those assumptions. Instead of saying oh, my gosh, he thinks I come to bed late, I'm asking, well, what do you mean by late, right? We're trying to create that funnel so that we get to the bottom line of that communication. And as the message sender, 
I wanted to make sure to ask those questions as well because I could already see something was askew with the results I was looking for. Lisa, as I listen to you, one of the things that I always like to offer is that um, we put a little bit of grace into the communication Mm -hmm. because there is that possibility of not having the correct interpretation that we sort of hold back. If we feel our emotions rising, then that's the point to say to then check with the person to go through that feedback process, like you said, what's late, that maybe, maybe... what I'm perceiving is not what there there was no ill intent. Exactly. So sometimes check that and when you feel your emotions rising. Yep. I do this sometimes with Bob, I do it with friends, I do it with sure. clients. Let's check that we're really talking about the same thing first before mm-hmm. we go off the cliff. Continue exactly. And you know what I'm a big believer in that as well, when in doubt ask. I think sometimes people fear looking dumb when they ask questions. But chances are, if you need clarification, especially in group situations, those others in the room might need that as well. And you're absolutely right with how defensiveness can create a communication barrier. I have done a lot of self-development and knowing when my heart rate is rising, I've got to stop, take that step back and say, okay, what's happened here to create that, you know, maybe going on to the defensive or, or becoming frustrated or whatever it is that's happening so that I can look outside of myself and say, what follow-up question needs to happen here so I understand what the real communication was in what I was just hearing or what I think I heard. Great, Lisa. I just want to uh, ask you this question. And, uh, you know, as you know, these days uh, it's not just the face-to-face communication or on the phone. Social media is playing a huge role for many people with the texting and, uh, you know, using Instagram and and Pinterest, uh, yes. uh, Twitter, et cetera. So can you just briefly speak to those things that would affect the process of communication within those various media or styles? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think that that's a great question. You know, the, way back we only had the telephone and face-to-face communication, right? And then we started to see email communication arise. You know, back in, gosh, I don't even know how long ago, but I was around, you know, <laughs> that day and age. And so now we're starting to see it in so much more digital space. You said it right. We've got social media and Facebook and and LinkedIn and Twitter, and all of them have their own norms, right? If you look at Twitter, you've got to get it done in 140 whatever characters, right? How much can you really say and be effective (laughs) in 140 characters? So I think it's important as we start to communicate in this digital world that we understand the norms of those digital spaces. I'll give you an example. My my father is in New York and he just started texting maybe a year or two ago if you can believe that. And so he sends a few texts to his children, you know, we're all down south and they all come in capital letters, right? And so you can just imagine, you know, his, you know, Gen X and millennial children and grandchildren going, why is grandpa yelling at me? <laughs> right, <laughs> right, yeah. Because of the, the understanding of caps. So I think as we start to look at communicating in these different mediums, that we first look to find out what are the norms, right? What are the the social norms, what are the rules, right, of those digital spaces so that we understand what we could trip up on. Too many exclamation points when I'm happy might not sound happy to the receiver. So I think it's important to understand what are the norms before we start to throw ourselves into those digital spaces, especially those that we're not yet familiar with. I think if I had to guess how many people actually read the privacy laws and the rules of norms for Facebook and Twitter and all these pages, I would very highly doubt anybody has done so. But those are important. Do some research when you're going to start to communicate in these spaces. Know what the rules and the norms are. Great, Lisa. I want to thank you so much for being our featured guest today, and I know our audience has enjoyed hearing the things that you've had to say. It's been my honor and pleasure to join you. Hopefully uh, we'll find an opportunity to do it again. It would be my pleasure. Yes, definitely, Lisa. We certainly appreciate you sharing your expertise, and it's really evident that you have a broad knowledge base on this subject. Mm -hmm. and. 
I know what you've said will be valuable to our listeners. Mm-hmm. Lisa, should should uh, some of our audience want to contact you about your services or work with you or learn more about what you do, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? My website is probably uh, the easiest in this digital world we were just talking about, and that can be found at www.h. BL, that's Home Business Life, hblresources.com. I'm here in the uh, Miramar area, but service clients throughout the United States. I can be reached by telephone as well. They're happy to uh, pick up the phone and communicate that way at 954-249-1202. And, of course, I've got the Twitter and the LinkedIn and all that. So search for me on my website, and you'll be able to get linked up. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Lisa. So again, uh, audience, you can contact Lisa at hblresources.com. That's H is in home, B is in business, L is in life, hblresources.com, or you can call her directly at 954-249-1202. Lisa, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your expertise with us. My pleasure, Christine. And Dr. Bob, it's been a pleasure. Yes, wonderful, Lisa. Can you tell us what final thought or key idea would you like our audience to take away from today's broadcast? You know, I think that communication is everything, whether it's at home, in business, or in life in general. Communicating effectively, whether it's your spouse, your boss, your associates, is just the first and foremost thing to learn and do to be most effective and successful personally and professionally. So I would encourage them to get more information, learn about themselves as well and how they communicate. And sometimes looking in the mirror is the hardest thing to do, but commit to doing that for their own self-improvement so that they can improve the relationships amongst everyone that they have interactions with. Wonderful, Lisa. Thank you so much for being our featured guest today. And I want to thank our audience for listening. Wherever you are, in whatever time zone you're listening, you can start to feel better right away. We welcome and look forward to receiving your comments about the show. So please let us know if there are topics you'd like to see us cover or a guest we've had in the past that you'd like us to invite back. Please contact us through our website with your feedback and suggestions. Remember, listeners, if you'd like to experience the same benefits our coaching clients get with us and learn how you can get control of your schedule, including easy ways to dissolve your chronic pain, stress, and anxiety, then give us a call at 954-900-2179. That's 954-900-2179. Mention that you heard our Stress-Free Now podcast show and your first session is absolutely free. Call today to schedule your appointment. For Christine Wright, this is Dr. Robert Wright, Jr. of www.stressfreenow.info. Until next time, be safe and be well. <laughs>